and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Some of you may know him on Twitter as Des Ministries. Some of you may know him as the head honcho of the Fragged System. And for, and for the rest of you, you may know him as that one, that one Aussie guy who thought platforming me was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, one, the one and only Wade Dyer. How are you doing today, man? Yeah, not too bad, mate. I don't think I'm ever going to tire of your intro. I love it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> But I think I obviously this is not our first rodeo. In fact, I'd say this is our mm. third, and it's at the very least a little bit more organized than the first one, where I was trying to cover like four four different games all at once, which is not not the best idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my my back catalog is not what you would call tiny these days. <laughs> no. Um. That, and that was the reason I didn't focus on the um, supplements to any of the, any of those because then we would have been here all night, mm. <laughs> or all day, or all day for you because fucking time zones. Yeah, I know. I've been dealing with this whole time zone nonsense thing for a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can add that to the lengthy, lengthy list of reasons list of reasons why I drink. <laughs> but fuck it, I'll just I'll drink anyways. But I. would what I'd like to get into first is walk me walk me through the chain of events that led you to realize that you that you're going that you're going to be doing a second edition of um, Fragged Empire. Oh man, see, start with the start with the tiny questions. Um. Okay, so look, I I, I did the initial Kickstarter for Fragged Empire first edition eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And as I think I sort of talked about previous, that was basically a passion project. Sometimes I think about myself as a GM. He just got super carried away. And that resulted in first edition. And then after that, I did lots of other different editions, sort of pulling, testing, experimenting with the, 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 um, the with different settings, but also the rule systems that I've created. Mm -hmm. And I found two things. So two things I think really led up to the development of second edition. Actually, three things. So firstly, I'm just a better game designer now. Look, I've been doing this for, you know, that, that eight years plus. Y you develop skills, okay? I'm not doing stuff as intuitively these days. I'm actually understanding why. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that's important. That, that needs to be stated. Uh, the second thing is... Um, of just having done this for a while and experimented with this different stuff, having a larger community, um, of being able to play test and understand the fragged rules. Like, I think I have a much better grasp of where the fun is, where the points of tension and difficulty were, and how could I sort of smooth and polish things out, and how could I sort of double down on the aspects that I think were the most resonant um, in Frag, and I would namely say that would be, um, uh, from a setting point, point of view, I would say the various cultures. So I've really doubled down on that. And exploration. I don't think I did exploration as well in first edition. So I really doubling down on making that a very big point of second edition, not just in terms of law, but also having the rules encouraging that. Um, making, I, I think, I think you, you kind of disagreed with this, um, which I appreciate. But I do feel like first edition had was unnecessarily clunky, and so smoothing that out in second edition, of course. Yeah. Okay. So this is just kind of like yes, yes, generally better, generally skilled, generally more aware. So that leads to second edition. Um, the third one is, is I have a much more stable business at the moment. I had a bit of money in the bank. I know I've got an established audience, and this, this gives me more confidence to financially invest um in this product and so i in my first edition i really wanted to put everything into one book because i thought okay look 
I'm probably only going to get one book out of this. I'm going to put it all in one. I want to make it, you know, so I end up cutting out a lot of stuff in first edition. And, you know, I kind of added it back with expansions. But with the second edition, I was able to much more go, okay, what is the ideal product range um, for this IP? And I thought, rule book, setting guide book. That's the premium. And I know we've just done a stretch goal for a third book, which is location-based. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to pay artists much more upfront, get things sort of developed so much more quickly. Um, yeah. Okay. So that was a very long-winded, rounded, rambly answer. But hopefully that sort of gives an idea of what led to second edition. Um, uh, yeah. I, I really think this is the best version of fragged empire i don't think i could do better than this mm -hmm. now something that i something that i had that i do remember i do remember bringing up in the video and for for the record no uh, when i said that i was i was mostly going on the whole adage of an artist is their own worst critic which <laughs> even though that was invented for art i do believe it applies to game designers as well oh uh, rpgs are so it's totally an art form Totally is. I know people like to claim, oh, everything's art. No, game design, like, RPG creation is world building, it's visual illustrations, it's it's tying mechanics to story, to theatre, totally art. Absolutely. And even, even with even with that whole everything is an art, um, I'd remind people of Sturgeon's Law for that kind of thing. You know, anything can be art, but 90% of all art is crap. <laughs> that's nice i like it uh, which may sound derogatory but it's basically it's basically saying that if you're if you're um talking talking like a bunch of a bunch of works is are not good it's it's me going congrat congratulations you've re you've realized that not that not every art is going to be stellar here's your no prize <laughs> and if that sounds a bit assholeish of me well you're right, <laughs> but more. But more to the point, I can see. I can see to an extent where you meant where what you meant when it came to some of the clunkiness um, in a couple in a couple things. And I'm guessing these are things that you're that you're planning on addressing. And I think I I think and that's the reason why one of the um, one of the key phrases that I wanted to get across in my in my unimpressions video that I did. With the documents that you um, that you shared, was I was getting a vibe of Fragged Empire without the fat, because mm. with um with certain a with certain actions with certain action economies, it felt like there was a lot of choice for the sake of it, like having mm. like having f four, like having five or six different actions for melee and ranged combat. And while I don't want, obviously, given where I come from, I don't want um, I don't want melee or ranged based characters to be one trick ponies, but at the same t at the same time, the um, the actions within those systems didn't quite differentiate themselves enough. Not sure if you ha if you had if this was something you had heard before. And the other thing is that the downtime it did in my own experience it did take a bit of time to. Get people acclimated to the de to the downtime systems. I was I think mm -hmm. I had a bit of an easier time because of the fact that my players had spent some time with the stuff that Crafty Games put out, puts out. Mm -hmm. But at the same at the same time, um, the idea of downtime being a set of mechanics into itself is something that I think a lot of people are going to have difficulty grasping because uh, simply because of the way. Um, people have been wired to look at campaigns for the la for the last twenty or so years. Yeah, yeah, I think that that, that works. So I guess um, so something that I'm really wanting to to do with the the second edition is um, find that it's basically the holy grail of game design is accessibility plus depth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and finding that perfect point where you're maximizing both of those. Um, the, the big trouble is that an easy way to gain depth is by adding choices and fact to a game options. 
but that can decrease accessibility and de decrease the sort of, it makes it inelegant, for lack of a better way of putting it. And so I definitely feel like second edition is definitely cutting out the fat. That, that term you used is exactly what I was initially trying to do. Um, but I don't want to say this, I don't want to give this impression that Fragged Empire 2 is a greatly different beast than first edition. It's not. I, the, my design philosophy was initially cut out all of the fat and then rebuild up from that so as that all of the different options are, are meaningful. Like, so when a player chooses something over another choice, it, that, that, that choice feels significant and satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, can certainly, I can certainly see that. Um, one of the th one of the things that I'm curious if the, if this was a point of emphasis for you was give was giving more giving more space to the fragged universe hmm. because and I I think I said this in the unimpressions video um, an issue that an issue that I ha that I had is that by pu by putting by putting both the I think I said this as well with um, when I did my review of Traveler. Um, putting the set, putting the setting in the same book as the mechanics can sometimes have this issue of one of one of them get one of them not getting the amount of detail that that it's needed. Mm -hmm. So you have so you end up having a more one size fits all leaning or something that's supposed to be set supposed to have that setting root, but also not having enough setting in the in the setting section yeah leading okay to so that's the both world situation um traveler 5e uh, isn't is a good example of this because mm. it's trying to it's trying to have the personal stuff the ship stuff and dip a little bit into the world of the third imperium and they should have been set they should have been separate books and in the past they were separate books mm. but for tra for, for um the, but for a traveler, um, mongoose second edition, complicated. Um, they put it all in one book, and I think that was a mistake. Yeah. Okay. So I think for the, the reason why in first edition it was all rolled into one was primarily because I was coming out of the gate as a completely unknown. I hadn't made or published anything before. No one knew of me. Um, I thought. Uh, not only one was I expecting to only ever do that one Kickstarter, um, but uh, I, I didn't have the confidence that I would have enough um, support from the community to justify the creation of multiple books. And so I was trying to say, okay, well, I want to do something, but I need to, I need to be a little bit conservative and I was a bit cautious and I didn't know I was going to succeed. And so I, was so I rolled it all into one book um, as a, as mainly a means of, you know, cutting down production expenses, reducing risks of development. Because if you stuff up development and production of your product and your business goes under, that's it. There are no extra iterations. There's no, there's, there's going to be no second try. Like, that'll do it. If my first edition... Um, had gutted me so heavily, like if I'd failed at that, then that there would be no future fragged. And so I'm still okay. Like even though in hindsight, like oh, I probably could have done two books for my first edition. I I don't think so. I think I'm glad that I did first edit one all in one book, and I do know that it did suffer a little bit in the way that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I think the alternative would have been a lot more money that I didn't have, and I'm not sure whether I would have. Um, that would have hampered my my business and the production of future frag stuff. Yeah. Um, the advantage of second edition and having an established audience and more confidence is I get to come out of the gate and do the absolute best premium option right away without holding back, without having to play it safe. I just get to go, you know, balls deep, risk it all, go for the absolute best. That's it. Yeah. And so that's 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 good. Um, something else that I I know that I brought I know that I brought up in the video that I think is I think is something that that I want to see go further on. And I'm hoping that this is further developed in the full book. Were the were the hinting were the playstyle hintings? 
Oh yes, because yeah, yeah, I noticed you liked those. The reason, the reason that, the reason that particular thing um, stood out to me is, I and you, you as well as I have probably heard, have probably heard one of the biggest one of the biggest lies that tabletop gamers and tabletop designers tell each other that you can use a, that you can use a certain system to run and to run anything, which mm -hmm. um, and let which in theory, which is a, the reason why I call that a lie is in theory. Can you do that? Yes. In practice, sometimes it's going to require more work depending on the system and what you're trying to use it for. I mean, could could I use could I use GURPS to run anything? I could, but I don't feel like breaking out my old graphing calculator to do that. Mm -hmm. Because Lord knows I'm going to need it, which is why I pick on GURPS at times. I like it, but I know but I know that I know that there are limits to what it can what it'll be able to do. And in that same vein, um, saying that you can do just about anything with a with a fantasy with a fantasy game, unless you provide some sort of guidance, people are going to stick to what they know. Mm. And with, I think the the key one of the key advantages I've always seen with Fragged is the ability to do multiple kinds of stories with it. If you want, if you want to do the space truckers thing, you can do that. If you want to do something with a little more intrigue, you can do that. If you want to do the fight in the bugs, a la Starship Troopers, you can do that. And yeah, I think there's. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. As a, as a final part of it, having having a bit of guidance to mm -hmm. what would be good ideas for that sort of thing is something that I'm one hundred percent all in on. Mm. So this this was something that I was kind of aware of and I could do back with Fragged First Edition and other games mm -hmm. is this... Um, I, I was aware that Fragged was not only very, very flexible for players, um, not just in the type of character you can build, but the type of play style that you could enjoy in a game... Like, you could have the power gamer sitting next to the narrative gamer at the same table of Fragged and have that work. Mm -hmm. um, and Fragged was also very mechanically flexible for GMs in the type of campaign you can run. So I don't believe that Fragged can do any type of campaign. I think if you, for example, want to do a game that's not really involving combat... Um, and like a social game, I think there's other systems out there I think are better than Frag. I think I know there are. I'll tell you this right from the start. But Frag was also very flexible in that it could do Star Trek to Star Wars to like uh, Blade Runner, you know, um, type games. It could all handle really, really well. And but I, I, I think I, fa well, not I think I failed in first edition to convey this because one is. I had very little GM advice in first edition. I was really just targeting experienced role players, not just people who'd played D&D &D and wanted something new. I was aiming for people who'd been gaming for like 10 years sort of thing, first edition was. Mm -hmm. um, I was also really restricted by space because I was trying to put the law and the rules all in one book. Second edition, I feel like I've got a much better grasp of no longer just intuitively knowing that this works, but being able to not just articulate how to do this, um, but also to start adjusting the rules to really lean into that advantage of flag fragged. Mm -hmm. um, and those icons that I put throughout the thing... Um, which are really helpful for players and GMs. They were, you know, guiding people towards, if you want, rules light options for combo players, like power gamers, narrative focal, focused play, or if you're wanting to mix it up and do something weird. Those are the sort of four play style archetypes I've identified. Mm -hmm. um, but then also giving GMs the tools if you want a gothic noir game, do this. Restrict your players to three resources for the entire campaign. Just give them spare time points and levels. Go. You know, they're going to have a pistol and trench coat for the entire game. And that will work. But then if you want to do, like, a, a Star Trek game, 
give them lots of influence so they get bigger spaceship, get have a big crew. Um, and then if you want to do like a 40k game, give them lots of resources so they can have big armor and big guns and go nuts, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that stuff is defined in the rule book. And I feel like I've gotten... Yeah, I've just gotten a lot better at articulating that. I don't think I... You know, like, the way... This is the way I worded to someone the other day was... Think about it if you were a writer. You write a paragraph of text and you can kind of read over it and you're like, oh, that sentence doesn't look right or that word looks like it's misspelled and then you can sort of intuitively have an idea of it works, okay? And eventually you you rework it a lot, you spell check it enough and you can get it to be okay. As opposed to someone who's an experienced writer, has a good idea of narrative structures, has very good grammar and has a good vocab, they will be able to articulate exactly why this doesn't work and they'll get it right much quicker and much more accurately a lot quicker. I feel like that's where I'm at as a game designer. I'm just... I know what I'm doing a lot better now. <laughs> and if I'm being uh, if I'm being honest, when I look at the vi- when I look at the visual design, there's o- there's always been a strong visual design with the Frag series. Um, mm. But when I look at the art that was supplied with Second Edition, oddly enough, there's one um, there's one 4X game that I was reminded of, and you've probably had this get brought up to you at least once. I'd be I'd be disappointed if it wasn't brought up to you at least one, at least <laughs> once during the development, and that is the Endless series by Amplitude, especially Endless Space One and Two, and especially mm. Two. Yeah, I know Endless Space. I uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of anything sci-fi, so I think I own most of their games. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you're pro- you are you're probably you're probably quite familiar with ha- with how um. Well, whoever whoever designed the, whoever designed the academy, I hope they get a flogging. <laughs> <laughs> I like endless space, but um, the the whole academy idea and and them pushing you around like that was not was not the best move. And whenever I do campaigns, I turn that off. <laughs> I think I vague ideas of what the academy was. That was the hero hiring or something. Is that right? I'm I'm not hundred yeah, percent sure. Yeah, in in the in the awakening expansion they made that they made that its own um faction oh okay. which led to problems oh okay <laughs> oh although per- although personally the um i think the the faction that i enjoy making memes out of it was horatio Simply because of simply because of how hilarious the concept of one man is that the cloning cl- guy? Yes, yeah, the clone. Yeah, the yeah. guy who the guy who's in, who is who made an entire civilization of himself. That's right. This is the super narcissist. That's right. <laughs> the super narcissist that looked like he came out of cone heads. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, but. I'd say I'd say the big reason I'd say the big reason for that is one could one could make some very loose parallels between the net between the Nephilim and the Endless. Oh, that's the um the Endless. That's wasn't that like one of the progenitor species? Was it? It's oh. the primary progenitor species within that universe, and mm. a lot of the. A lot of st- a lot of stuff that's found is remnants of the- of their old tech, including um, dust, as well as the fact that they had a war between the be- between those who wanted to upload their entire beings into ver- into their super internet, i.e., the virtual endless, and those who didn't, mm. which resulted in both races get both sides of that conflict getting noped out of existence. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's uh, yeah, that's right. It's it's bringing back some law stuff, man. I've forgotten all this stuff. Oh, right. And of, c- I will I will admit that th- I'm not the I. That that's admittedly that it it is a bit of a it is a bit of a leap when it comes to those parallels. But to but to the credit, I do recall somebody on the Discord server. Um, making a making a hack of the endless universe for Frag, so 
comes full circle. <laughs> and it's not the first time I've seen that kind of genre hack because I saw that exact thing with um, a project called Frag Citadel. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen I've, I've seen a few of that. People have been doing some hacks, um, mm -hmm. especially like any of those four rec computer games where you can make your own race and upload a picture. Yeah, I think I even tried to make some Kaltorans in endless space once, but mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Now, given the given the um, given what I mentioned ab about 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 stream about streamlining things, there were there were a few there were a few elements of streamlining that I didn't get into when I did that unimpression simply because I felt that it w that um it was going to be a little bit too far into the weeds for the point I was trying to make, mm -hmm. but I would like to go into the issue that you had with healing and repair rules. And how you plan on addressing that with FE two? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to um, uh, lay out the parameters of the of the, the 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 point so that way I can sort of see if I can address it accurately? On the on the kick, you I remember you talking about um, simpler mm -hmm. healing and repair rules. Mm -hmm. So. What I wanted to go into is what you found cumbersome about the, about those rules and how you plan on addressing that. Okay. Oh man. See, this is okay. We're gonna we're gonna come into an issue here because I've sort of mentally moved on so far from first edition mm -hmm. that my memory of even how it works in a lot of the specifics is just it's no good. Um, I I, I can't remember it anymore. <laughs> so I won't be able to sort of say even much how second edition is super different to first edition on that front. But I do know in second edition, you've basically got two methods of healing. So one is post-combat healing. Mm -hmm. uh, after you've had a fight, um, someone in the group needs to perform a, or can perform a first aid roll. So you make a medicine roll, get a 12, and then everybody in the party heals two attribute damage that was dealt with in the last five minutes, i.e. the combat you just finished. Mm -hmm. um, and so this kind of, and the design philosophy, I know this is not exactly what you're asking, but the design philosophy behind this is actually to encourage um, everybody in the party to tank a little bit, not to just have one tank, because there's actually a mechanical advantage to having a single tank. So let's say you've got a guy with a, he's a legion, his big heavy armor, and he's carrying a giant body-sized force field, and he has the traits to, like, taunt people to make them attack him. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's kind of a mechanical advantage to that, and that type of character could be fun. Um, but I want it to also be viable for everybody in the party to sort of take turns, sort of, oh, okay, I've been hurt, so now I'll fall back. And, you know, or someone's like, well, I haven't yet taken any hits, so I can sort of jump forward to save my friend and take a couple of blows because that feels kind of nice and self-sacrificial. And then the game can reward that type of gameplay as well by just having a flat two to everybody. Um, but then there is this point that if you're taking more than two damage um, during a fight, you'll have damage that's going to linger on your character. And this attribute damage can actually linger between campaigns. And this is like, you know, in a story, someone gets shot and a big shot to the shoulder and that wound can kind of linger there. It's like, that's important. Narratively, that was important when that sniper shot you, you know, in the shoulder. And that might linger with you for a couple of sessions, okay, until you get it patched up. Um, and so that, that feels narratively correct, um, that it's got some weight to that hit was important. And the, the second way that you can heal in Frag is a care acquisition role, which is you spend a spare time point. Um, and you perform a roll, get a 12, and you can heal a character three attribute damage that was dealt at any time. Mm -hmm. And this is important because the spare time point that you spent on that could have been spent on um, buying a small item, modifying your gun, purchasing a trade good. And so there's this sense that you're actually spending, for a lack of a better term, loot, you know, um, on healing your character. And... Yeah, so those are the two ways that you heal, and it's just clean, that's it, those are the two ways. Uh, there are other ways. Yes, you can purchase traits and items that can sort of amplify this a little bit, but predominantly, that's it. Mm -hmm. yep. 
And I always know that Frag just does Frag does um its resource management and its damage systems are very unique in the RPG field. I don't know of any other RPG that does what Frag does. Um, and so I do understand that that can be a little bit of a mental leap for people. But I think once people experience it, they can start to feel for that, get a feel for how it works. I think that could be satisfying and its originality can feel a bit fresh and exciting, which is something good. I want that. I want that in the frag. I want that in the tabletop RPG scene. I want a little bit of like people can be sure feel familiar and comfortable, but we need to do new design decisions. I think, yeah, and I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, mm -hmm. uh, something uh, something else I'm can I'm consider I'm um, I'm considering about I'm considering about pondering the orb as the, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is the ma is the matter of spa of spacecraft combat because I'm no stranger to ship combat in RPGs, but mm -hmm. there is a but there is a bit of hesitancy from some that I've I've noticed simply because a lot of times it ends up feeling like a whole like a whole other system that you have to that you have to adapt to instead of something that feels like an offshoot of the boots on ground combat. Uh, yes. Okay. So I can talk about that one pretty easy. Okay. So there's there's two sensors because um, we'll call these alternative combat methods. Okay. So there's this expectation that personal combat, everyone gets it, understands it. You're moving around, taking cover, shooting, throwing grenades. Okay. Kind of XCOMI like. Everyone gets that. Then you have spacecraft combat, and spacecraft combat. I, I've tried to do two things. So one is I want it to feel like the rules are same enough that everybody gets it very quickly and intuitively. But then I also do want it to feel fresh. Mm -hmm. So the way that I've, I've done this is, one is spacecraft are built just like characters in many ways. They have traits, they have attributes, stuff like that. You're basically building a NPC for your party when you build a spaceship. Mm -hmm. Um, and a character might get toolboxes, but a spaceship, you will install workshops or cargo space and things like that. Um, and attack rolls work just the same. You're rolling dice, you're going for strong hits. Rather than endurance on your character, you have shields for your spaceship. So yes, it's a different name, but it functions exactly the same. So, and this all feels the same. Everybody gets it. You know, these core mechanics... Uh, once you've learned personal combat, you'll pick those up instantly with space combat. But now, I do want it to feel different, though. And um, so, whereas the personal combat is moving and taking cover and stuff like that, instead of space combat, everybody makes a system roll. So you might make a command roll, an engineering, or operations, or a gunnery roll. And everybody in the party will make one of these per term. And... This is kind of this sense that I want you to work together as a team. So someone's locking on and then someone's lighting up the ship and the other person's shooting it while someone's trying to put out fires, okay? Mm -hmm. Now that feels different, okay? The other thing that feels different is the way that spaceships work. So in spaceships, you build up your velocity and you've got to manage your velocity. You might try and line up into the gravity well of a planet so you can hook shot around it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so... It, it, I, I kind of describe it as it feels like submarine combat, but if the submarines had, like, ice skates, so they're kind of skidding around. Um, and so that, that part of it feels different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully that helped. Yeah, trying to have that sort of same but new... Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, the other thing that, the other thing that I was curious about is... Um, I could see I could see some people some people who um who didn't who stuck to mostly fr stuck to mostly fragged and di and didn't jump into the other um systems so I want to tap into some of the some of the systems that were in uh, that were in other fragged games that are being integrated into FE2 and I'd say the first one that I that would be worth going into is Munition the reincarnation of momentum from Frag Kingdom that's replacing ammo and rate of fire. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that I think anybody who's been familiar with Fragged Kingdom, um, uh, especially Fragged Kingdom, but maybe even Fragged Eternum uh, or Fragged Seas, will start to notice, they'll see how these... Uh, many of the systems in Fragged Empire 2 have sort of grown. So, um, uh, yes, the clearest one is definitely the use of the munition system, which is basically a rebranding of momentum. So momentum in Fragged Kingdom, you could you sort of attacked, you built it, and then you could spend these points to add dice to your future attack rolls. And so the idea of Fragged Kingdom was kind of, you might go, chip, 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 big important attack, spend all my momentum, you know? Um, and in Frag to Turnum, um, you built momentum the same way, chip, 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 but then uh, it was built for, uh, it, rather than adding dice to your attack roll, would actually add damage to your attack roll in Frag to Turnum, and so that was sort of to amplify the more brutal nature of that game. Um, munitions is a rebranding in Frag King, in Frag Empire, sorry. You, each of your weapons start off with three new min- munition points, and you can spend these to add a D6 to your attack roll, mm-hmm. and then you can reload, and reloading just boots you back up to three munitions. Um, there are, of course, particulars in, in terms of the way that different weapons use these munitions. So, for example, if you use an SMG, you will actually gain two D6 for spending a munition point. Um, a cannon requires you to spend a munition point just to attack. Um, a disruptor weapon can spend munitions to add endurance damage to your to your shot. So there are slight iterations on that. And I found this replaces the system in first edition, which basically tracked your ammo and your clips of your weapons. And the reason why I did this was I found that the ammos and the clip tracking was just... It was extra bookkeeping... Uh, which I don't mind bookkeeping, but I found it wasn't as fun as the the momentum system. The momentum system just felt more exciting because your sort of players spend it to add drama to their turns, and it helps to make one turn not feel like the previous turn more so. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found that more interesting. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with the system I've come up with first in, in second edition. I feel like it's a lot more positive and fun. It's this kind of extra little mini element there that's not too much bookkeeping. Another system that I've developed, uh, sort of a design ethos, this I, I would say, a shift as I've created multiple Fragged products, is Fragged Empire First Edition had lots of guns. There were, I think there were like four pages of weapons that you could pick from. And then you add a template to those called variations, and then you can modify them with other little tweaks like laser sights and scopes and stuff like that. Um, But a design structural shift that I found worked much more effective, and this was really in Frag Determinum, I think was where I nailed this down was. So in Frag Demo 2nd Edition, you have one page of weapons to pick from. Mm -hmm. And I know that seems really tiny, especially compared to first edition. But each one of these is really different to the next one. An SMG feels really different to an assault rifle, feels really different to a shotgun, feels really different to a grenade to, uh, you know, or a, a machine gun. And where I've put more variance is actually in the template section of when you're constructing a weapon. Um, so you might have, you know, a, uh, an arc fire assault rifle or a disruptor assault rifle or a spine launcher assault rifle or a rail assault rifle, you know, these different sort of things you can put over it. Mm-hmm. And that's where the variation comes. And I found that this was, I know it's sort of hard to verbally explain this, but I think it comes up with a system that feels a lot more elegant, um, uh, a lot more, the player's choices feel more meaningful and there is less rules but more options and more meaningful options in second edition and this is this is what i want as a game designer as a game designer i want less rules that do more things and those things to feel more satisfying and different to each other more meaningful i can get that um Um, mm. if i I suppose one i suppose one way that i could put it is 
the comparison the compare a comparison between the weapon design that you might see in an arena shooter whether that be halo whether that be quake or what have you and the design and the design cho the design choices when it comes to guns in a more um, in a more mil in one of the more um military like shooters mm -hmm. the reason the reason i say that is as somebody who spent way spent way too many hours with stuff like Unreal, <laughs> I yeah. I like it when you there's not there's not a bunch of different slightly different variations of a rocket launcher. There's just mm -hmm. a rocket launcher and how you use it. Mm -hmm. um, same thing same thing goes with the with the railgun and all of these have their own strengths and weaknesses as opposed to. A bunch of different variations of, say, assault, say assault rifle or SMG or L or LMG. Yeah. Where, where um, you certainly aren't hurting for choice, but how, but how different those individual ones are in the moment-to-moment -moment play doesn't factor into things as much. Hmm. And I know, I know, some people might might say in my in me bringing up um. Modern Warfare 2 with this. Well, the difference is get, is going to be things like attachments and perks, and I'm like, um, that's a bandage, because perks is something yeah. that's going to be char <laughs> that's going to be character centric, mm -hmm. and with and with attachments, those are still just those are still just slight variations. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, I think the I think the approach that you're going with is not is is not to ask what is. To use the to use an SMG example, not what is the best SMG, but rather, why are you equipping an SMG? Yeah, and I, and I think this also helps for players as well during combat. So let's say they're fighting someone and they've got an assault rifle. Um, there's kind of okay. Well, I know what a core assault rifle is, so therefore I can understand how that that works, and so I, as a player, can actually make choices relevant to that i'm like yes there are rail assault rifles or a plasma assault rifle or a spine assault rifle that will tweak that and that will feel different but the broad strengths they know what an assault rifle is going to do okay so it's going to roll more dice it has better base stats but it's not doing any special strong hits and things like that yeah mm -hmm. but th th this sort of stuff i think people will really appreciate once they play it once they build a character i i, I think they're going to go Hmm, I'm not sure about this. And then they do it, and they're like, ooh, yes, this is much cleaner and better than first yeah. edition. Yeah. Uh, I suppose you've, got, you've got to play it to experience it to really get it, I think. I suppose I suppose if I wanted to continue that example, I could bring up the we the weapon specificities in Doom or Do or um or the or the Doom successors. Um like if some if somebody if somebody needs to do a whole lot of stun locking against an enemy, like say those goddamn lost souls back in the day, well, that's <laughs> what the plasma rifle's for. Yeah. At least at least until you get. And the and you need so, you need obviously obviously the shotgun and then later the super shotgun is your jack of all trades weapon. The rock the rocket launcher ha has a lot has a lot of advantages, but there's also the whole splash damage and. Plenty of people have gotten killed by splash, by their own shots with splash damage, myself included. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the point, the point is, 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 is that if you're, if you're, when you're picking a certain weapon, it should be a, it should be a conscious choice instead of just numbers go up. Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, okay. I'm going to select this one because it's got plus one hit over the previous one. Mm -hmm. That is such a boring difference for me. Like, I, I, I'm like, okay. If there are options there for people who like simpler rules, I'm not saying everything is complicated. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, for example, I'm no longer. Oh no. Anyway, I've probably rambled on too much yeah. about this one. But like, the, yeah. the other big thing I think we need to go over is space magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Fair enough. I think. Um... <laughs> Do you want me to just just run with this one? Yeah, because space magic was not in was not in the core book for the for the old system. So I'd say <laughs> we need to delve into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. 
So what what what's happened is because um, I've you know in my Kickstarter video I've got a giant big text pop up that says new arcane rules and that immediately can to, can can translate to multiple things in di different people's minds. So firstly, space magic has always existed in Fragged Empire, and by that, okay. So let me let me let me tackle this from a law perspective first, and then a rule perspective. So. Um, as an example, the primary space magic is jump drives in Fragged Empire. FTL travel. Um, it is basically saying there is a new resource called Lay Dust, and you can use this Lay Dust to open portals and uh, ignore science so you can travel between stars and have fun. Okay? <laughs> Which is something that science fiction has been doing forever. It's got to introducing a new resource and then sort of extrapolating out fun that you can do with that. And um, there's psionics is also in Fragged Empire, which allows you to alter time and mind stuff. But the law justification for this is like these little nanites that rewire a person's brain and give them extra abilities. Um, but then you have other types of space magic. For example, one called All Power, which is you channeling power from this uh, basically, possibly a god, we're not quite sure, to, like, do healing and do super space monk ninja stuff, okay? And so there's this degrees um, uh, in, so in terms of the space magic, in terms of what it can do. But the general angle that I'm going for is much more like Star Trek, in that the space magic is presumed to be scientific, and it's just that it's so advanced that we don't fully understand it. Um, and that's kind of the approach, because it's fragged very much has the presumption of logic underneath it. You know, it's set in our universe, in the Milky Way. Humans, real humans, and Earth existed in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so there's this idea that everything can be explained, but some stuff can't be at the moment because we don't know. And I actually like that, because this this allows me to add more spice and fun to the game. There's a little bit of, uh, okay, well, this one's explained like psionics, but this one's not like with all power. And so it gives some freedom for the GMs to have some fun with it and do some things. So that's kind of it from a lore perspective of where I'm going from. Um, but then uh, from a mechanics point of view, this is something that I did in Frag Kingdom and especially in Frag Eternum, where I created this new mechanic system called Arcane Rules. And this is basically a player can declare, I want to use my arcane power that I've used, you know, maybe they're a psionic, um, to, to read somebody's thoughts. And so they then make a skill roll to see if they can do that. But by declaring they're using their arcane power, GMs are then instructed to say, increase the roll difficulty by two. And this increases the narrative options that a player has the capacity to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And so psychology is normally a skill used to understand other people's intentions and their state of mind or their motives. You then attach that to, to, to a psionic arcane power. You can now directly read their surface thoughts. It increases the narrative options that that skill can perform. But the GM is also instructed, if the roll fails, you should also amplify the, the complications that can come about that. So the GM's narrative options are also advanced. So let's say they fail at their psionic roll, they might do some weird psychic effect of like... Um, like messing with a person's mind or maybe they create some sort of time distortion. You know, maybe they accidentally reset time by or fast forward everybody five minutes or something like that. Um, and so it kind of adds the... How do you put this? The um, it, it, it amplifies the sort of options that can happen at the moment. And so in Fragged Empire 2, I've basically just tightened up the rules and got much more specific, offered more guidelines and more structure to using these weirder powers than what I did in first edition. In first edition, they were always there. The same stuff is there from a law perspective. I've just tightened up the rules behind it and uh, 
made it clearer. Like I said, like I said, fragged empire without the fat. Yeah, yeah, without the fat and the ambiguity. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just, it's more clear. And I think this is good because this, this, this gives the players more guidance on what they can actually do with their arcane powers. Gives GMs more guidance to here's how you stop your players just doing whatever they want. You know, um, psionics is just mind and time. You can't do all the other weird stuff. It's what it does. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with all that in mi- with all that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Not a date, a window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the original plan was to have the PDFs out in everyone's hands basically as soon as the money comes through, um, and then have the physical books printed by the end of the year because I was hoping to have them at the PAX convention here in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we've done a stretch goal for a third book, and this and this obviously means production is much more delayed because I'm now doing a third book. Um, so the, the plan now is to, uh, I still are going to uh, get the PDFs pe- into people's hands for the original books as soon as I can. As soon as the Kickstarter funds come through, people can send me a message and I will send them the PDFs, okay? Or they can wait a little bit until the pledge manager's finished in a, in a, in a couple of months and then... That'll come through probably. Um, but the physical books, I'm not anticipating these to come out until uh, early, mid next year, I think has to be the honest approach. That I really like early next year, um, but uh, I, I don't want to get into the political specifics of it, but unfortunately the disaster that's happening over in Ukraine has also affected multiple people within my development cycle. Mm. Um, and that's... Uh, I, I'm not sighing because it makes things slow. I'm sighing because I have talked to these artists and I know a little bit about what's going on, and it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it also does affect the production of Fragged as well. And, um, yeah. Yep. And... All, all of that said, I am certainly looking forward to seeing how Fragged Empire Two is going to be de- is going to be developing. And of course, you know I don't sleep, so I'm definitely going to be <laughs> keeping a close eye on things. But with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. <laughs> Always lovely to talk to you, Meldra. Always. Yep. And- <laughs> Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>